Hey, let me begin with a question. It's a question for all of you. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your life stage. It's a question that applies to everybody here. And the question is this How is your quest for fulfillment and for meaning and for satisfaction in life? How is your quest going? Notice I didn't ask, are you on a quest for meaning and satisfaction and wholeness? Because I know that you are. We are all wired to be on a quest in this life for meaning. You are on that quest. I am on that quest. We all are. So the question is, how is it going? Are you looking for that fulfillment in a relationship, maybe a, another person on a horizontal level, you're looking for meaning in that relationship? Or are you looking for that meaning in some sort of accomplishment, maybe a work accomplishment or something in school or athletic compl- uh, an, an athletic accomplishment? Is that where you're, you're looking for meaning and satisfaction? Maybe you're dabbling in a few different things, maybe some different philosophies or worldviews. Where are you looking for satisfaction, and how is that search going? Today in our passage that I'll read here in just a moment, we are going to look at the fulfillment that only Christianity brings, that only Christianity offers, and that only Jesus Christ can make good on. The passage we're going to read here in just a moment, of course, was written by the Apostle Paul. And it was written to a group of Christians that he had never met before. But they were living in this world awash with options and opportunities and teachings that were promising to bring them fulfillment, but ultimately could not deliver upon that promise. And today, as we read these words, in essence, it's as if the Apostle Paul is writing to us, another group of Christians that he's never met personally, but who are living in a world surrounded by things that promise you fulfillment, but ultimately cannot deliver. Only Jesus can meet that need that you have. Only Jesus can deliver upon bringing you ultimate satisfaction and joy, and wholeheartedness, and meaning in life. Here's your takeaway thought today, and we'll jump into the text here in just a moment. It's this. This is the the warning that the Apostle Paul is going to give us. He's going to give us a warning, and then he's going to give us the why behind that warning. Here's how I'll summarize it this morning. He's, He's going to say this to us. Do not be kidnapped. Don't be kidnapped. Because you have been made complete in Christ. Don't be kidnapped because you've been made complete in Christ. That's how we'll break up the passage here in just a moment. I think that will make sense. A simpler way to summarize everything that I'm going to say this morning is this. If you've got Jesus, you don't need anything else. If you have Jesus, you're lacking nothing, and you don't need anything else. If you're a guest with us this morning, we've been traveling through the book of Colossians and today's passage is Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. So if you have your copy of God's Word, would encourage you to find Colossians 2, verses 8 to 15. In just a moment, I'll have you stand. Uh, here at West Conroe, we love the Bible. We're so thankful that God has revealed himself in the Bible. We don't have to wander through this life as orphans. We don't have to wander through this life uncertain of who God is, uncertain of of what he desires from us as his people. He's spoken to us clearly uh, through his word. So in just a moment, I'm going to read this passage. After I read it, I'll declare that this is the word of the Lord. We really believe that. And if you're thankful for that, Uh, In just a moment, when I declare that, just invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. So let me invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to read for us this morning Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. God says this to us through his word, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world 
rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with the circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, and when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him. And he forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. And he's taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Church, go ahead and be seated. Don't be kidnapped. Verse 8. Why? Well, because you've already been made complete in Christ. Verses 9 to 15. Let's look at verse 8. The Apostle Paul warns us, do not be kidnapped. Do not be taken captive. At this point in the book of Colossians, there's going to be a turn. So the first uh, section of the book up until this point has been very worshipful. It's been very warm. It's been very encouraging. It's been uh, saturated in, in prayer, Paul's prayer for these Colossians. But here we have a turn in emphasis that will carry on through the rest of the book. Uh, Paul is going to begin to share some warnings Uh, with these early Christians. You'll recall that there were some false teachers, there were some wolves, uh, some dangers that were beginning to encroach on this church. And really for the rest of the book, Paul is is going to put them on guard. He's going to warn them. He's going to put them on high alert that they would not fall prey to these false teachers. And so that's going to be the tone really through the rest of the book. And we see that right away in verse 8. He gives these Christians a warning. He says, be careful, or watch out, or be on guard. Verse 8 says, be careful. Be careful about what, Jesse? It tells us that no one takes you captive. That no one takes you captive. That word captive is drawn from military vocabulary. In this day, it was very common for armies to invade these different cities. And when armies would invade these cities and overtake everything, they would take citizens as captives. This might have even been something that the Colossians themselves had seen with their own eyes. And so the Apostle Paul is is reminding them, in a spiritual sense, do not become a prisoner of war in the spiritual battle that is raging all around you. And, And by the way, there's a spiritual battle that's raging all around us. And the Apostle Paul is reminding them, do not be taken captive. In fact, the original word could quite literally be translated as kidnapped. Do not be kidnapped by these false teachers. Now, why would Paul need to remind them and warn them against being kidnapped? Well, very simply, it's because these false teachers, they might have sounded very smart. They might have sounded very enlightened. In fact, they might have been uh, promising things that, that, that were untrue, and yet they would say, if you just kind of step away from Jesus for a moment and you come listen to us, we, we promise you you'll find fulfillment and meaning and life. But, but, but they didn't show up in trench coats. Because these are predators, and predators never show up in trench coats. That blows their cover. And so these predators that were preying on these early Colossians, they were coming not in their scary trench coats. They would not have been obvious just by looking at them. Rather, they were bringing very lofty speech. They were bringing promises. They were bringing intriguing thoughts that sounded very attractive, and they were hoping to draw people away from Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, do not be tricked. Do not be taken captive by these teachers. Now, how were they kidnapping people? Well, it wasn't with their hands, quite literally. Notice back in verse 8, be careful that no one takes you captive through, this is how they were doing it, through 
philosophy. Don't be taken captive through philosophy. Now, listen, if, if you're a philosophy major this morning, do not be worried. Okay, he's not talking about philosophy in the way that we often think about philosophy, like different philosophical schools, Greek philosophy. That, that, that's not the sort of philosophy that he's describing here. No, he's, he's referring to the specific content, the specific teaching of these false teachers that as they were trying to pull people away from Jesus and kind of get them into their own corner. That's what he's attacking. That's what's in his crosshairs is this philosophy of false teaching. We know that because in the original language, uh, Paul uses what we call the definite article, which is simply the word the. And so Paul refers to this as the philosophy. It's likely that the false teachers were, were describing their teaching using the term philosophy to kind of clean it up and make it sound a little bit more intriguing. And so Paul says, do not be taken captive by the philosophy, by this particular false teaching. Now, I want you to notice how he describes this philosophy. Look back in verse 8. He uses three uh, sort of descriptors here, empty deceit based on human tradition and based on the elements of the world rather than on Christ. So you can see he's creating this dichotomy between what they're articulating and Christ himself. In other words, there's no overlap here. These things cannot be synced up together. It's either Jesus or it's following these false teachers. We cannot blend these things together. He, he says what they're doing is, is defined by empty deceit. When Paul describes this teaching as empty deceit, basically he's, he's saying this is just a religious word salad. That's how he's describing their teaching. They're saying a lot, and they're saying nothing at all. If you listen to them, you're just devouring empty calories, and you can stuff yourself with empty calories for so long, but eventually you'll be hungry again, or you'll feel miserable. And so he describes this false teaching as empty deceit. He... he, he and he, he wants us to understand this. It's not just that Paul is annoyed by this, but Paul is adamant that to listen to this is deadly. That to listen to this empty deceit will, will ultimately lead to ruin. In fact, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, it's a, a corollary passage to Colossians 2a. I want you to listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, 6. He says this, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. It seems that these false teachers, with their empty words, they were downplaying these Colossians' obedience to Jesus Christ. And Paul wants to protect this church from anything that would downplay obedience to Jesus Christ. And so he calls what they're doing empty to see. He, he continues and he says it's based on human tradition. Basically, its authority is from below and not from above. And even worse than that, we see that he says it's based on the elements of this world. Now, it's a very hard phrase to translate, but most commentators believe that what Paul is saying here is that the source of their false teaching is actually demonic. Satan has been a liar from the very beginning, and Satan is continuing to use this false teaching to lie to these early Christians, to pull them away from their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And so Paul says that the source is ultimately demonic. I like how one writer described the teaching. He said it was effectively a religious Venus flytrap. And so it looked really attractive. It looked very in Inviting. It might have sounded very popular, but it devoured people quickly. Once they nestled themselves in the middle of this philosophy, the Venus flytrap closed up. There was no way to get out of it. That's how he describes this teaching. So he says, Don't be kidnapped by this, friends. Don't be captive. Now, this morning, you may say, oh, okay, Jesse, I'm tracking so far, but the, the specific philosophy that, that Paul was attacking here, like, I'm not at risk of going down that direction. Uh, now, by the way, I, I never want to assume that in anybody's life. That's why week in and week out here at West Conroe, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to preach God's word. 
faithfully because I never want to assume the gospel. Uh, but but it, it very well might be the case that you're saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm not tempted to go down this road. What does this look like for me and my life in 2024? And, and that's a, a very good question. I, I think the application we can draw from this is, is this, that, that you and I too, we're, we're in a world just surrounded by false philosophies and worldviews and promises that tell us things, but that ultimately want to pull us away from Jesus Christ. These things might look attractive, they might be popular, they might even sound innocent, but they too are a Venus flytrap that wants to close up on us. In fact, I think when we remember that this false teaching was based on the elements of the world, based on this demonic source, we know that the enemy has not stopped working in our day. So there are things out there with this demonic source that want to pull us in. It's a good reminder that that of everything that you take in, all of the content that you take in on a daily basis, that none of that is neutral. That nothing that we hear, nothing that we meditate on, none of it is neutral. It might look flashy and it might be popular, but the wisdom and the ways of the world, they will devour you. So don't be taken captive. Stay on guard. I want you to listen to how James, in James chapter 3, describes wisdom from above, godly wisdom. What does that look like in our lives? Well, here's how James describes wisdom from above. He says it's it's pure, and then it's peace-loving. It's gentle. It's compliant. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's unwavering, and it's without pretense. That's, That's the wisdom from above. But what does the wisdom of the world look like and sound like? What is the wisdom of the world that we're surrounded by? How does James describe it? Well, he he describes it like this, earthly and unspiritual and demonic. It will lead to ruin no matter how it's dressed up. So I think it's a a good question, a good practice to ask ourselves uh, a few diagnostic questions. And by the way, as I'm sharing this with you, I'm asking myself these things too, because I have the same phone that you have. I, I, I use the same apps that you use, right? We're, we're, together, we are just surrounded by these things. And, and by the way, Jesus has put us in this world at this time for a particular moment and mission. I'm excited about that. Like, I'm not trying to get out of that. There's no way to try to extricate ourselves from the world. God has put us here for this very moment. You're up to the task. And yet, we want to walk through this world with wisdom from above and and not using earthly wisdom. So one way we can grow in wisdom with all of the things and all of the noise uh, and and, and all of the frequencies around us, it's to ask us, ask ourselves these questions. Is the content that I'm absorbing through my phone, through the TV, through podcasts, through YouTube videos, through news channels, through books and arguments and articles, is all of the content that I'm breathing in, is it stirring in my heart an affection for Christ and an obedience to his word? Are the things that I'm taking in, is it stirring in my heart a greater affection for Jesus and greater obedience to his word? Are the people who I lend my ear to, so students in your classroom and in your peer group, your friends, the people who you're talking to and lending your ear to, uh, 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 are they stirring up greater love for, for Jesus in your hearts? Greater obedience to his word? Uh, the, the people that you interact with at your office, or the voices that you're exposing yourself to online? Are they stirring up in your heart a deeper love and treasuring of Jesus Christ and a delight in his word? The, the people that you interact with, whether that's in school, in a locker room, on a sports team, in a peer group, on an office, staff, whatever it might be, we know that they're not neutral because nothing is neutral. So those voices, the question then becomes, is how are they shaping me? And am I at risk of being kidnapped by some agenda other than the agenda of Jesus Christ? 
think those are helpful questions to kind of constantly keep before us as we too are awash in all sorts of worldly things. Parents, let me put a very simple tool in your hands. Uh, And I just have to believe you are already praying for the protection of your children and keep doing that. Let me just add a little bit of specificity to it. So parents, grandparents, a very simple tool that you can put in your tool belt is to pray for the protection of the minds and the hearts of the little ones that the Lord has entrusted to you. And by little ones, I mean zero to 18 years old and even beyond. To constantly pray, not just for their protection in a general sense, but let me give you some specific tools that you can pray for. Lord, protect them from worldly wisdom that wants to confuse them and lie to them and draw them away. Lord, protect them, protect us as a family from error. Protect us from sin. And protect us, Lord, from misplaced priorities, from throwing ourselves into things that ultimately lead nowhere and cannot deliver us. Protect us from those things. Jesus tells us to pray that we would not be led into temptation, but that we would be delivered from evil. And that's a a prayer that, that I think parents, grandparents, we can begin to pray with that specificity, trusting that the Lord's going to take that and, and use that in ways that we can't even imagine. So we pray that we would not be taken captive. But, but Paul does not just tell us, don't do this with no reason behind it. He doesn't just say, don't be taken captive for no reason. No, he, he grounds that in a why. Why is it that we should not be taken captive? And I realize we've used 22 minutes on one verse. I promise we're not going to use 22 minutes on every verse. We're going to move through this second half fairly quickly. But this is the why behind why we should not be taken captive. It's found in verses 9 to 15. And the reason we shouldn't be kidnapped by false teaching or false worldviews or false lies or false ideologies that surround us, well, it's because you've already been made fully complete in Jesus Christ. You're lacking nothing in Jesus Christ. So why would we turn to something else to find Fulfillment. We see this in verses 9 to 15. Look in your Bibles, verse 9. Paul writes, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Verse 10, And you, follower of Jesus Christ, and you have already been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. What Paul's doing here is very simple. These false teachers are saying you need to follow us if you want to experience real completion, real fulfillment. And Paul says, no, 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 no. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you lack nothing in Christ. You've already been filled by him. You don't need anything added to your life in order to experience satisfaction and meaning. It's all found in Jesus Christ. The reason to not be taken and captive in verse 8 is found in verse 10 because you've already been completed in Christ. The Christian Standard Bible translates this phrase as filled. You've already been filled by Jesus. The New American Standard Bible uses the term complete. You've already been completed by Jesus. Both are good translations. This is the same word that the New Testament often uses uh, of, of the prophecies, the promises from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. That's the same word used here. In other words, Jesus is the fulfillment, the completion of all of these promises. That means we don't have to look ahead. We don't have to look outside of Jesus. He himself is the end. He himself is the finale. And so it's the same word that Jesus, when we're looking for meaning and satisfaction, he himself is the end of that search. He's the finale. He is where it is ultimately found. And so the rhetorical question is this. If you already have that in Christ, then why would you go anywhere else? 
That's the rhetorical question that Paul poses to them and that Paul poses to us. If you have Jesus, then you don't need anything else. And it's a wasted quest to try to find meaning anywhere other than Jesus himself. A few years ago, uh, I was invited to be on a panel uh, at this theological conference. And I know some of you, I just put some of you to sleep for just hang with me. Uh, I was invited to go be on this panel and uh, there were four panelists. Uh, Each one of us delivered a paper on a very narrow, specific subject. And uh, so we delivered our papers and then there was some back and forth questions and answers among the panelists. And then the moderator at the very end of that, he said, okay, uh, when we dismiss, uh, you, the, the room, 50 or 60 people, you will be able to line up and come ask these panelists any questions that you have. I wasn't prepared for that, but I was like, all right, here we go. Now, the gentleman who was sitting to my left uh, was a very esteemed uh, individual, esteemed, highly respected scholar in this particular area. He, he, he was sitting right next to me. Uh, he was the guy who wrote the books on this topic. Uh, he was the guy that everybody else needed to read and wrestle with uh, and understand if you really wanted to, to know anything about this topic. He, he was literally sitting uh, right next to me. And so they, they dismiss the room. People start lining up. And I kid you not, the line to talk to this guy was out the door. And here I am sitting with absolutely nobody in front of me. <laughs> now, the two guys on the panel on the outside, they were smarter than me. They saw where this was going. So the, they, they kind of got their stuff and they slipped out. So it's me and this other guy. The whole room is ready to talk to him. And I'm sitting here just all by my lonesome. All right. Now, I'm not wired to need sympathy or need people to feel bad for me. But I promise you, if you saw me there, you would have felt bad for me. <laughs> it was that awkward, that obvious. So people are working their way through the line, and this guy gets up, questioner comes, and he talks with the, uh, with, with the well-known scholar. And then when this guy leaves, uh, he sees that I'm just kind of awkwardly hanging out. So he, he just kind of taps on the table, and he says, hey, man, sorry about this. Your paper was good, too. I was like, <laughs> thanks, man. P- appreciate it. Um, but, but then as he was leaving, I said, hey, listen. No offense taken at all, because it only makes sense that people would want to go to him, because this guy is the authority. This guy is the the, the one who people want to learn from and need to talk to. It's a no-brainer to go to him. In fact, if I wasn't sitting here, I would be in the line. Why would someone come to me? rather than go to him. It's a no-brainer. It only makes sense. And that's effectively what Paul's point is. Why, if you're filled by Christ, why would you go to something lesser when you have him? It's a no-brainer. It only makes sense. So if we have Jesus, we have everything, despite the different promises that exist out there. Now, in our remaining moments, I want to point out two ways that we're completed by Jesus Christ. And this is where we're going to wrap up. In verses 11 down to 15, the Apostle Paul gives us two ways that we're filled or we're completed by Jesus. Those two ways are through Jesus's crucifixion and through Jesus's conquest. Jesus's crucifixion and Jesus's conquest. We see first that we are filled by Jesus's crucifixion. Verse 11, you were also circumcised in him with the circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, catch this friends. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. There, we see that we find fulfillment through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Now, the term circumcision there, it's referring specifically in this context to Jesus's death. So no hard questions, conversations on the way home. That's not always how the term is used. But here, this is specifically referring to Jesus's death on the cross. That's how we are filled. That's how we are completed. And Paul uses graphic language, and intentionally so. He wants us to see that Jesus, his life was removed from him so that we could find life and forgiveness and wholeness in him. We've been completed through Christ's death and resurrection. Paul says this in Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. By the way, you'll remember that he addresses or points out in verse 12, baptism. That's why here at West Conroe, when we baptize somebody, they go all the way under the water as a picture of being buried with Christ in his death. And then they're raised out of the water as a picture of resurrection, of life in Jesus. Our life comes only through the death of Christ and his resurrection from the grave three days later. And I just want you to notice verse 13. And when you were dead in trespasses, what did God do through Christ? He made you alive with him. And he forgave us of all of our trespasses. That means on the last day, the Lord is not going to pull out something from his back pocket, wave it in front of your face, and say, did you forget about this trespass from all those years ago? You can go to sleep at night knowing that will not happen because your trespasses have been dealt with once and for all on the cross by Jesus Christ himself. And so notice how the the Bible describes the gospel. He says, you were dead, and now you are made alive. I've said it before, but it's important to, to say again. The gospel is not that Jesus makes bad people good, as if behavior modification was all that Jesus is after. No, the gospel is not Jesus makes bad people good. The good news of the gospel is that God, through Christ, makes dead people alive. And how does that happen? Well, he tells us that it comes, verse 12, through faith in the working of God, through faith in what God has done through Christ, by trusting Christ, by receiving Christ to be forgiven of my sins and have eternal life in Christ. Maybe this morning you would say, I, I've never trusted this Jesus, but I realize that, that my hopes and my, my search for fulfillment, it, it, it can't happen outside of Jesus. I want to receive this Christ you can today. And if you're looking for someone to visit with, I'll be down front. We'll have some counselors. You can receive Christ right now. I'm saying, Jesus, rescue me. I trust in your cross and in your resurrection. That's how we are made alive. The last thing that I want you to see, we're not only completed by Jesus' crucifixion, but we're completed through Jesus' conquest. You'll, You'll notice that Jesus is the victor over a few things. Verse 14, he's the victor over our sin debt that stood against us. But Jesus took care of it. Verse 15, there are things that stand against us, but Jesus is the victor over them. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. This is language drawn from a military parade that would have happened in this day when the victors would come into a city and the captives that they uh, overran would be walking behind in chains so that the whole city could know who won and who lost. And this is telling us that Jesus is the winner over all things. He's the winner over our sin. He's the winner over things that stand against us. And so we're completed not through our own victory, but through Jesus's victory. So today, maybe you are struggling in some way. I just want you to remember that according to verse 14, that Jesus is the victor over your sin. Verse 15, that Jesus is the victor over all that stands against you. That Jesus is the victor over addiction and anxiety and hopelessness and fear. Jesus is the victor over the greatest enemy we face, which is death. And if Jesus can deal with death once and for all, he can deal with anything else that you're facing in this very moment. You may not feel victorious today, and that's okay. That's kind of the point of the gospel. 
that we are not victorious in and of ourselves, but our victory is found in Jesus and what he has done. So again, I ask you, how is the quest for meaning going today? And why would you look anywhere else than Jesus Christ for meaning and for hope and for fulfillment. So many people in our world, they, they turn to substances or to accomplishments or to a person or to a philosophy, but none of those can fill you. They make promises, but they cannot keep them. Only Christ can. So this morning, do not be kidnapped by anything other than Jesus. Be captive to Jesus and nothing else because only Jesus can make good on those promises. Don't be kidnapped by worldly philosophies, however popular they may be or however nice they try to appear. They may sound innocent, but they're Trojan horses that will ruin real people's lives. Don't be taken captive. So what does obedience to Jesus look like for you in this moment? It looks like something. Maybe it's surrendering surrendering your life to Christ for the very first time. We want you to know that you can receive Christ today. Christ invites you to come by grace through faith. So you come and you trust him. Maybe for you, it it looks like believer's baptism. Maybe that's a step you haven't taken. And you come visit with us. We'd love to walk you through that. Maybe there's something in your life that you are turning to for meaning and for fulfillment. And today, you need to come and you need to pray. And you need to say, Jesus, I'm turning from this because it cannot Give me what I need. Only you can. Maybe you just need to get before the Lord and give that to him today. That might be what obedience looks like. Whatever it looks like, we invite you to come pray, come visit during this final song of response. I I don't know what your week ahead looks like, and, and neither do you. The Lord does, but we don't. Uh, but I'm sure it'll have ups and downs. I'm sure it'll have hard conversations and decisions. I'm sure you'll grow weary or maybe frustrated. But listen, friends, there's nothing that this next week holds that can dampen or deaden the good news of verse 14, that Jesus has already erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. I don't know what you face, but you can walk into it knowing that that's true. And that's why with Christians from all over the place, we can sing these sorts of songs that say things like, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul.